Great day, and it's great to be here. Good to have a you. A lot of greats. Two star along for the ride today. Sergeant, and then there's a sergeant major. Sergeant Michael Hype joins us as well, Delegate District 92. Michael, good morning to you. Good morning. It's great to be here. Wonderful to have you. Yeah. You know, a little m- rain outside, and we've needed this time. really bad. Yeah. Right? I'm, I'm not disappointed in the rain. Mike joined us for our political breakfast second week in a row. <laughs> first thing he looked around and said, where's the oatmeal, folks? You can't eat anything else. You're too old to eat anything except oatmeal. So, Mike, I understand these guys get together regularly. They go to the same restaurant, get the same waitress. What was the ordering process like when the waitress came by? Uh, she goes, uh, would you like the regular? Yes. Would you like the regular? Yes. Would you like the regular? Yes. It just went around the table like that. <laughs> we, we don't have a lot of originality. <laughs> you guys are setting your ways by this point. Oatmeal, oatmeal, oatmeal. Oatmeal. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> uh, who, got, who got the brand muffin anyway? <laughs> our guest in this first segment is from delegate district one uh delegate pat mcgee and pat good morning how are you sir good morning rob good to be with you i'm doing great wonderful to have you along for the ride i think of you every time the name jack nicholson crosses my uh my my day and it makes me smile i have to tell you <laughs> oh, that's good you can't handle the truth bro. This is, if you, haven't, <laughs> you just can't Pat, Pat does a, a killer uh, one man show as Jack Nicholson actually he'll do it as, as a two man show because he'll go back and forth on the stand from A Few Good Men that uh, marvelous movie with Jack Nicholson and Tom Cruise yeah I have a useless skill of just being able to memorize <laughs> the movie lines the first time I see him so I only have one question for you, Pat. Did you order the code red? That's the only question I have for you this morning. <laughs> Son, we live in a world that has walls, and those walls have to be guarded by men with guns. Who's going to do it? You? You, Mike Hornby? <laughs> <laughs> I want I want the truth. <laughs> uh, Pat, Amendment 1 passed yeah. as it went by, and uh, had you on the program about that. Uh, Kayla Kessinger was on the program, uh, I believe it was Election Day morning, I think, in order yeah. to discuss yeah. it. Were you surprised in any way that it passed? Uh, not really. I was very pleased it passed. I'm sure you were, um, but, but were you surprised? Yeah, but- uh, no, I wasn't surprised. I, I figured the majority of West Virginians would be with us on that issue. Um, but, yeah, I was very pleased that it passed and um, on to bigger and better things now, I guess. Are you aware of any legal challenges to the amendment that are brewing? Negative. There was some talk about the way the bill was published or the way the amendment was written on the ballot since it did not include the entirety of the bill that some were going to be challenging it. You're not aware of any challenges that you're... No, I'm not aware. I'm not aware of anything like that. They're welcome to try to do that. So what is it that the amendment will do? There's a lot of rumors out there. What is it that the amendment will do, and what is it that it doesn't do? Well, for your practical practical life, it keeps everything the same, as is, legally speaking. It just prevents medically-assisted suicide um, from being legalized in an easy way going forward. So nothing changes as far as medical practices right now in the uh, current state of West Virginia. Uh, so nothing changes in that respect. It just prevents euthanasia from ever coming and gaining a foothold in our state um, in an easy manner anyway going forward into the future. So with that passed, what's the next thing that has to happen legally in order for the changes to be made to make it into the Constitution? Well, it's part of the Constitution right now. So it's it's done? Yeah, it's done. As soon as it passed, the voters, um, according to the Secretary of State's office, it's currently part of the Constitution. Very good. Okay. Uh, Then we will move on from Amendment 1. No, before we do that. Do you have questions? Yeah. uh, uh, Good morning, Pat. Uh, There were Mm -hmm. were some ads uh, in support of Amendment 1. Uh, No Mm -hmm. ads uh, against Amendment 1, at least that I received. Uh, Yeah, there were plenty of ads against Amendment 1. Were they? Okay, they did not get to my my household. Uh, Who paid for the ads for supporting Amendment 1? Uh, Some outside groups. Um, uh, got involved in, in support of Amendment 1. Um, I'm not familiar with all the different names, but, uh, can, yeah, some outside groups got involved. Any? Can you think of any one or two that supported it? 
any, any one or yeah, two. Yeah, you, you mentioned some, you mentioned They're, some outside groups. You cannot think of all of them. Can you think of one or two that did support Amendment One? Uh, I can't remember the name of the pack off the top of my head um, that supported it. Um, yeah, I don't have that name off the top of my head, but yeah, um, uh, one or two supported it. Okay, looking at the at the uh, the support, was it fairly even throughout the state, or was it certain sectors of the state more supported than others? I would say some of the urban areas like Morgantown and Charleston uh, came out against, but uh, the vast majority of the rural areas were in support. Berkeley County came in huge. They were in support of it, too. Yeah, they were in support. I'm not sure it was a huge number. That I can't, I forgot it was exactly. pretty big, man. It was like 55%. That's pretty big. That's bigger than the state yeah, vote. Yeah. 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 Okay. yeah, bigger than the state vote. Mike Hyde, anything? Uh, no, I, I, actually, I want to move on to another topic. Go I right want, ahead. I want to, Pat, I'd like to get your, your take on um, you know the upcoming session and how you think we're going to deal with the uh, the new governor. Uh, we've had the same governor for the past eight years, and, and um, we've now moved on to what I would consider a more conservative governor. Um, how do you think the uh, the legislature and the new governor will get along? I think we'll get along real um, great. I mean, I think you know several of us have had conversations with um, Governor Elect Morrissey. He's going to be hands on, I think, which is uh, great. I mean, it's a it's a great change. It's a a welcome change um, um, because you know we didn't have. Um, uh, well, we didn't have a governor that really, in the last eight years, actually showed up for work. Um, I'm not, you know, necessarily trying to insult the guy. You know, he just was absent a lot of times and, you know, didn't get into the weeds and didn't seem to express a whole lot of interest in, in the policies uh, of the state, um, at least not from a hands-on perspective. And it would be nice to have somebody around that um, we can we can bounce ideas back off, back and forth off of with him and his staff, um, and uh, and sort of all get on the same page and have some sort of common vision, hopefully, so that we don't have some sort of um, you know we don't have infighting. And I think uh, Governor Morrissey, Governor Elect Morrissey, will uh, will be able to to facilitate that. So I think it'll be very nice having having him around. Um, I know he's got a transition team right now trying to weed through and choose, you know, who's going to head up, you know, what um, what division, what department. And so I'm looking forward to, you know, having a collaborative sort of team effort to to do what's right for West Virginia going forward. And it's going to be, a, a, a you know, um, just a breath of fresh air coming in, I think, so. And you know, there's a lot of uh, there's a lot of people that think we don't spend enough time on substantive issues. Uh, we spend too much time dealing with social issues. Most of them are in our on, Facebook on, comment on, section yeah, right now, brother. Absolutely. Um, and and then we don't spend enough time on, on the fiscal issues. What's your take on that? And do you do you think we can walk and chew bubble gum at the same time? Of course we can, but I take uh, objection to your to your to your comment that social issues are not substantive. I mean, uh, uh, our society is necessarily social, so we have to deal with with uh, the social issues of the time. And the fiscal issues uh, are derived from, you know, the social issues that underpin that. Um, and I can just point to Amendment 1. As soon as you uh, all these other states, nine or ten states that so far have legalized medically assisted suicide, a new financial interest is now created. And now you're going to be dealing with those financial issues. So all fiscal issues ultimately, either implicitly or explicitly, are connected to some sort of what you uh, uh, call a social issue. And that's a modern category, by the way. Delegate Pat McGee, our guest here on the program. Pat, what are your interactions like with Patrick Morrissey? Have you had any? Yeah, they've all been very good. Um, I had him up to the Northern Panhandle several times. Took him around. He toured the Fiesta Ware plant. It's in my hometown or right near my hometown. And um, uh, he's toured the, uh, the, 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 the Wheeling or the sort of the Weirton, the old Weirton Steel Complex. 
and um, met with a lot of the blue collar guys there. And uh, you know, he's reached out for my opinion on a couple things in the past. Um, he seems like you know he really wants to get down and work as governor, and I'm um, I'm looking forward to it. He has talked about uh, streamlining government, making government more efficient. It's not an uncommon theme for anybody who's new to an office, by the way. But uh, having yeah. served in the legislature for a few terms yourself, and Mike Height, you've been in there for a little while yourself now, too, and Republicans have been in control for a few uh, years now. Are you convinced that uh, government needs more right-sizing? Or is there still areas where you think that you folks could cut spending and clean up uh, waste in West Virginia? Oh, I, I mean, well, I, I think, think so. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, I, I, I think so. I mean, I, I think, you know, we started um, with DHHR and, and splitting that up and trying to find efficiencies there. I think there's still a lot to be found out there. Um, Can you be specific, Mike? What's that? Can you be Pacific? Do you have some specific? Yeah. Well, I, th I think you have to you have to go into uh, DHHR I individually. You have to go into the human services and you have to say what services are we uh, providing and where exactly is the money being spent? Um, and I think there's there's currently a deep dive into that. Um, not just you, you can look at the health facilities as well, which is another branch of that, and say you know do we need to be in the hospital business? Do we need to have six or eight hospitals, uh, health facilities that the uh, the government is running? You know, the, the government doesn't always run things very well, so I think you could probably eliminate some of those and, and save millions of dollars. And I think from our past discussion you would include PEIA in that category would you not uh well i you know i think PEIA has become a a political football in a lot of aspects and um i, I think that you know every every year we go back and forth about what is the legislature how is the legislature going to fund PEIA and give uh state workers raises and and not just enough to cover the the raises in PEIA, but the rest of of the world also has to deal with uh, you know increases in their premiums as well. So, you know, many times in in uh, the, the workers outside of state workers, um, they see that as well. They see premiums go up more than their raise, um, and state workers have complained that they're they're just not uh, they're not any different than anybody else. So why are we why are we running an insurance company? I guess is my biggest point. Um, we're the government. We shouldn't be in the insurance business. We need to get out of it. Um, but I'm not sure how we do that. But I think there's uh, there's got to be a way. Pat McGeehan, what about PEIA? Well, I mean, we had a briefing. Uh, correct me if I'm wrong, Delegate Height, uh, from the PEIA Executive Director, I believe, for the board. Mm -hmm. uh, what? Two months ago, maybe. Yeah. And, um, I mean, the first thing I noticed is when he gave the briefing, he opened up talking about the inordinate increase in price on diabetes drugs. And that was driving their recent announcement to increase premiums. And when I asked him what was causing this, I could pretty much tell you what the cause is, is that, um, those drugs now, these diabetes drugs, as of 2022, just two years ago, received approval from the FDIA to be used, um, you know, off-label for weight loss, like Ozempic, things of that nature. These are all the same type of diabetes drugs. And the price exploded, of course. And that was one massive factor to why PEI prices are going up. I mean, and, and it's not just a small amount of price increase. It's huge. And so we need to look into that. I mean, look, if you're taking these drugs to lose weight, and I'm sure you guys have all noticed the uh, the people that are starting to use these drugs every day and getting prescribed this ozempic stuff just to lose weight, uh, you know, it's, it's causing price increases, and it's causing increases in prices uh, for people that actually need these drugs for diabetes. Um, and so there's probably some way we can look into that and, uh, uh, and do something about it. Hey, if you're using this drug simply to lose weight for cosmetic reasons, okay, that's different than someone that really needs it for diabetes. 
And so there's probably something we can do there to save money on the PEIA side. I don't know what that is yet. We can get creative. Yeah, talking about being creative, education comes up. Uh, and uh, we tend to treat education the way we've always treated education. And we're losing teachers because of the salaries. Uh, we're all, and the teachers we retain in are uh, working with reduced salaries. Can we be creative, or how can we be creative in looking at our educational system in total? Looking at the education system in, in, in total? Yeah, look I at, mean, for our teachers, the standards, the, edu- uh, the uh, salaries, the uh, support base, and the like. We should focus education about the student, first off. Right? Just throwing money at teacher raises constantly over and over again is not going to solve it. I mean, we've thrown 5% teacher raises um, uh, across the board for many sessions in a row now. So just talking to me about how, oh, we just need to give more and more raises to public school teachers, that ain't going to solve anything, all right? So if you want to actually educate kids in a classical way, and by the way, I don't care for the educational apparatus K through 12, whether it's higher education or the uh, K through 12, you know, basically coming in and teaching all this left-wing stuff, and it's infiltrating our schools in West Virginia, so that's the most important thing. You know, classical education was first and foremost not just about educating uh, students about how to, you know, uh, work out some sort of uh, uh, problem so that you can be a more efficient uh, cog in the machine for some corporate uh, uh, institution. It was about forming students into becoming a moral individual. And so we need to get back to something like that. And that really depends on who's teaching our education. So not about just giving teachers raises. We need to focus on quality individuals that can teach in a proper way. How you, how do you propose to do that, Pat? Well, I'm working something out, and I, when I have it done, maybe I'll come on your show and share it with you. <laughs> that's, that's a tease. Can you give us a little bit more Pacific? No, I can't. It's classified. I'm sorry. I told you I'd have to kill you. <laughs> it's a Top Gun quote. Come on, man. Laugh a little more. <laughs> Here's the other thing, too. And and I, the legislature gets tasked with this uh, all, all the time. How do we fix education? How do we fix education? How do we fix education? When you're constantly at, at 47, 48, 49, 50, um, whatever. And the the reality is the State Board of Education sort of controls that, and we have no oversight over them. We, we tried to fix that a couple of years ago with an amendment. It didn't pass. People of the state of West Virginia said, no, they didn't want us doing it. But yet you keep asking the legislature, what are you going to do about education? Well, un- until we have some modicum of control over education, it is very difficult for the legislature to make uh, drastic changes that need to happen in West Virginia when it is controlled by the, the Department of Education. And and we can make laws. That doesn't mean they have to follow them. And sometimes they don't. Yeah, I would take a step before that, Mike. Uh, I'm not sure there's been a thorough assessment of all the facets of of what goes into the education state board of education is one i see this as a role of our legislators to do a comprehensive review of all components of the education well we do uh, that's why we have, it, that's why not. we have a, a an education committee and they review this stuff all the time my, my point is when we when we try to institute change Sometimes there's pushback from the Department of Education, and and they can choose to enforce it or not enforce it. And so the legislature doesn't have as much control as a lot of people may think. And I'm going to disagree some with Pat. I I think our teachers are still underpaid. Um, I don't know that that's the problem with our education, though, is them being underpaid. They are underpaid, but there's, there's a whole lot more to us being 47, 48, 49, 50, then our teachers pay. Well, the, well it depends good, on good, what good. region of the state you look at. That, that's correct as well. The fascinating part with the legislature's involvement with education is you constantly hear the legislature needs to fix education. And then when the legislature does something with education, you get, well, there's the legislature trying to take over education, sticking their nose someplace <laughs> where it doesn't belong. Why don't they fix foster care instead? Yeah. So I, I don't know what 
the expectation is of the legislature to fix education when the state of when the state board of education is the overseer of education in the state. And the people in this state rejected an amendment that would have made the state BOA answerable to the legislature. So the people of the state don't want the legislature to fix education. They want the state BOE to fix education. Yeah, I yield to all that, Rob, but I, I have not stated. Let me try again with my, my question my concern. Sure. And I've not been as eloquent as I'd like to be. Uh, we do have committees uh, in, in both the Senate and the House side, but my sense is they're looking at kind of the edges. No one has taken a thorough, deep dive into our education system. What is working? What is not working? What are we doing in the state that we could be doing better? What are the limitations, restrictions? There's a whole limit of things that could be looked at in great detail. And I well, think well, the I think legislators that Mike are Pat, the best. I but I think Mac and Pat have tried to tell you this, Bill, before, and that is that there's only so much power they have because they don't have control of education. The state BOE does. The, the legislature can say, let's do a comprehensive look at education, but if you can't get the material to study it from the state BOE, how are you going to conduct a comprehensive examination? Or, or if you implement it, how do you get them to enforce it? And yeah. and they won't. Yeah, no, I, I was not talking about the implementation stage. I'm talking about the stage before that. And I don't know, has the uh, State Board of Education been an impediment in providing the information? Mike, oh, oh, Pat, yes. how much cooperation do you get from the State BOE? I mean, I've never been on the Education Committee, so I don't know. But my talks with Joe Ellington... You know, he, he, he seems to be able to get information from him. We've We've done comprehensive looks. I know he has uh, on education, and we've tried to come, uh, in years past anyway, come with some sort of solutions, tweak things here or there. You know, but the, but the, at the end of the day, you know, I mean, we, we've just continued, continued to lower standards, not just in education, but in society in general. We live in like a you know, a post-participation trophy society. And that's the problem inherently with public education. We lower standards, we lower standards to the lowest common denominator, and then we ignore the gifted kids, the kids that can excel, to cater to kids that just don't have as much potential. And we don't want to face that that uh, inherent truth that's anthropologically backed up throughout history that some people have more potential than others, you what know, it, because we just don't like to admit it. We it, It's cruel or something like that. And we need to get past that. Hey, look, we need to, uh, we don't need to lower standards. We need to increase standards, hold standards higher to teachers and to students. Um, and, and that's part of the problem and part of the struggle that we're fighting with here. And on that note, we are out of time. Patrick, thank you for yours. Have a great day. Thanks, Pat. Hey, thank you, thanks Pat. Thanks a bunch. You guys... God bless. Bye. Delegate Pat McGee.